One little boy shook the pastor's hand after church and said to all sincerity, with all sincerity to him, when I grow up, I'm going to give you some money. Well, thank you, the pastor replied, but why? Because my daddy says you're the poorest preacher we've ever had. <laughs> Thankfully, neither one of those things have actually happened to me. But today is the fourth and last sermon in our series on stewardship. We've been using Reverend Mike Slaughter's book called Shiny Gods, and we've spent uh, the last few weeks exploring what idols we might struggle with in our lives, what things we put above our relationship with God. We've talked about work and the importance of it and how God designed us to be the vehicles through which his blessings pour out all over the world. Last week, we learned about John Wesley's advice to make all you can and save all you can and give all you can. And this week, we end again by thinking about generosity and what it really means to give from the heart and what happens when we do so. Our first scripture lesson this morning that Barry read from Leviticus contains instructions. They are instructions for the Israelites about gleaning, about farming. Now really this rule that they are given, which is to not uh, harvest the food on the ends, is to help them to learn how to share, much the same way you make your kids learn how to share when they're little. It's to help them know how to make provisions for those around them who are in need. They are told not to harvest the edges, but to leave those parts of the harvest for those in need who would come in and gather them up afterwards. Just like God created plants that clean our air for us, taking in the CO2 and providing oxygen for our lungs, God also created ways for us to care for one another and gave us these rules to help us be able to provide for the world, saying to us, there is enough if you do it this way. Now, sometimes when I preach on stewardship, I feel like the preacher who heard from his head usher these words of wisdom, your stewardship sermons are improving, there's still no money, but we have a lot more IOUs. There are times, there are a few times that I feel more alone or worried or stressed about my sermon than when it comes to sermons about money. But when I read scripture, I see that Jesus spoke unapologetically about this very thing, about the ways that we use our money in service to God's kingdom. There are so many passages about money in the Gospels, like the one where Jesus encourages us not to store up our treasures in heaven, or we have Jesus' Sermon on the Mount in which he says, Blessed are the poor, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven, or the story of Jesus turning over the money changers' tables, or the story of Jesus telling about the widow's might, or the story of the talents where a landowner gives care of some money to his servants while he's away. All of these are stories that were about service and money, but were in reality stories that said to people, what you do with your actions, with your money, your treasures, your talents, your land, says something about what you think about God. It isn't about how much money we put in the offering plate on Sunday morning, but rather that what we put in the offering plate says something important about what we think about God and the way God works in the world. Think about your own giving for a minute. Does it, compared to where else and how else you spend money, say that your priority is God's kingdom? Does it show that you believe that what you have belongs to you or that it belongs to God? Does it say that, that your money is what we've earned, what we deserve, and we can do with it what we want? Or does it show that you believe God, the creator of the universe, has made you a steward of your possessions only? Does what you put in the offering plate on Sunday morning tell the world that you are trusting in God's provision, or does it say that you are afraid and worried that there won't be enough? Does it say you manage your money well, or that you spend frivolously and without thought? Scripture says, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Stewardship, friends, is a gift that begins always with the heart. Generosity comes from a heart turned toward God and God's work in the world. A friend of mine recently told me a story about a time that she received an inheritance from her father after he'd passed away, and it was a very large sum of money, the most money she had ever had in her life, and she found herself felt paralyzed by it, scared and worried about how to spend it so that it honored the work that her father had done to, to save it. 
She was so paralyzed by this thought about what to do, worried that what she was going to do wouldn't be right, that she did nothing for weeks and months for the longest time. It stressed her out. She began losing weight. It affected her health. Until finally, one day, in just pure exasperation, she looked up at the ceiling and yelled to God, tell me what to do with this money. She said in the moments afterwards, she finally realized that what was paralyzing her from action was her thought that this money belonged to her dad, that it was her dad's money, and so she needed to do right by her dad. But through prayer, she realized that that wasn't true at all, that before the money was her dad's, it was God's. And once she knew in her heart that it was God's money, she felt free to just give the money away. She used it for people who were hungry, for people fighting addictions, for homeless persons needing housing, for local community needs, for ministries within the church. She gave all of it away, and she was no longer paralyzed to move in the world. She felt free. Corey Ten Boom said it this way, I have held many things in my hands and I have lost them all, but whatever I have placed in God's hands, that I still possess. When Dwight and I first started giving regularly to the church, I remember feeling really worried. We had uh, just um, both gotten full-time jobs. I um, was serving my first church full-time. Uh, And we had spent a lot of time in school being really stupid about the way we spent money, so we had a lot of catching up to do once we finally got a full-time job. One of my younger sisters just has her first full-time job this year as a teacher in Baltimore City, and she was so excited when she got her first paycheck, I'm pretty sure she went out and spent the entire thing. Now, she'll catch up soon like we did and realize that you can't really do that. But as we began to give regularly to the church to pay attention to what we were giving, instead of being worried, we found just the opposite. We found that as we made that giving a priority, we found we had to rearrange our budget. We had to think more about what we were spending and how we were spending it in order to make sure that it was all going to work. It resulted in a change of thinking for us, and we found that as we gave faithfully and cheerfully and willingly, things just started to work out. Money would appear from places we didn't expect it to. We always, always had enough. God taught us how to use our resources, how to be good stewards of what we have been given. Now, there have certainly been times that we have turned away from that. When we um, became parents full-time for the first time, when three children suddenly walked into our door, we began to worry about not having enough for them, about not uh, having money for what they wanted and what they needed. And it has taken us a long time to remember once again that we have to live into the feeling of abundance of what God has given us and not a fear of scarcity in order to live into the life that God wants for us. Now, often I find that people want to know or wonder about what happens with the money that you put in the offering plate on Sunday morning, and it's a good question. You should want to know what happens with it. Now, the simple answer is that it goes to pay for the ministries of the church, right? It helps keep the lights on on Sunday morning so that we have a place to worship. It helps pay for Bible study materials so that people can come to know God more. It goes to missions around the world and in our own neighborhood. It pays for the salaries of our staff who help to provide for and plan and implement our ministries. But I want to tell you just a few stories of some amazing things that can be done with the stewardship of the gifts that we are given, the way that the church uses them to do things in our conference. So for those of you who didn't grow up in the Methodist church, or for those who did and have never heard this, in the Methodist church, uh, we give to our conference. Our conference is all of the state of Maryland, except for the eastern shore, and then we add on three counties in West Virginia. I don't know why we do that. I don't have an answer, but we do. All of Maryland and three counties in West Virginia. And each of our churches in the conference give what we call an apportionment. A portion of our giving goes to the conference and is used in lots of different ways. And I just want to tell you three stories about the way that that money is used. There's a church called Douglas Memorial United Methodist Church and about a dozen other um, United Methodist churches in the greater Washington area that have created a ministry to reach out to female veterans of war to assure that they receive the care and resources they need to get back on their feet again. Did you know that there are approximately 1.8 million women veterans, that 8%, that's 8% of the total veteran population. 
Women who return from the conflicts in Afghanistan and Iraq are often single and come from urban areas. Many of them suffer mental illness or alcohol and substance abuse or a combination of disorders after serving. Uh, Reverend Helen Fleming, the pastor of Douglas Memorial UMC, said it this way. She said, I am amazed at such a dilemma when it comes to women, and women veterans. They served us, but we realized that we weren't doing anything to serve them. God has opened many doors through this ministry. With the money that comes from some of our apportionment dollars, they began a ministry that provides computer access and hot meals and drama therapy and career clothing closets and a staffed prayer room, just to name a few of the pieces that go into that ministry. That's what happens with the money we put in our offering plate. Our conference, the Baltimore-Washington Conference, leads United Methodist in the northeast corridor of our country in the number of projects that volunteers and mission teams undertake. In 2010, there were 140 VIM trips, people who left their comfortable home churches to help vulnerable people recover from a disaster or deal with the results of poverty. These mission trips contained volunteers that served all over the U.S. and, and also in foreign countries from, from Appalachia to Zimbabwe. They went all over the place. And our apportionment dollars helped to train their leaders to provide information and encouragement to churches to create these teams, to help small churches link up with larger churches to increase their resources. It helped them participate in making disciples and in sharing the love of Christ. Our, the teams in our conference helped after Katrina, after Sandy and Haiti, after earthquakes and tornadoes and flooding. For every need, there was a team that was sent out. They welcomed everyone to go with them, from teens to grandparents, regardless of skill level. They, their motto is, there is always a job to do and love to share. Let me share with you one more story. You guys know that one of my favorite ministries in our conference is our camping ministry. I've loved our camping ministry since I went for the first time in 1992. I've only missed one summer since I went in 1992. A couple summers ago, uh, the statistics told us that there were 1,112 young people that attended camp at West River or Manadokan, the two ongoing church camps in our conference. I can tell you from my experience that each of them left with the story to share with lives being changed. But one story told by a friend of mine named Katie Bishop, who's a pastor in the Western region, I think shows us, is, it, is an inspired story about the endless accounts of God in action. She told us a story about one day a woman named Crystal from her church who had special needs decided uh, to go camping, and while she was there, she decided to do something daring. She wanted to do the ropes course. And while she wasn't completely physically able to do it, she said, Crystal, um, Katie told us that Crystal asked the group to pray for her as she started to walk the line. So the group that she was camping with stood all along the rope course with her, praying for her as she walked. And despite her physical limitations, she was able to walk almost two-thirds of the wire by herself. When she finally reached the zip line, Bishop said there was a handful of teenagers who made a semicircle around her and they cheered her on. They wanted to let her know that she was loved. They wanted to let her know that with God we can do anything. Katie said, we press on and at camp we become living sermons for one another. Living sermons for one another. Let me share with you one more really cool thing. In 2011, the King James Version of the Bible celebrated its 400th anniversary. Did you know that? 400 years, over 400 now. Its poetic language has inspired millions to a richer faith in God. But the Bible often speaks best to us when it speaks in our own language. There are currently 2,527... Uh, there are Bibles, let me do that again. There are Bibles available in 2,527 2, of the world's estimated 6,500 language. Do you hear how many languages we're missing? Like over 3,000 languages that we still need to put the Bible into. But in the United Methodist Church, we are helping that to happen. They recently helped to create one of the newest, a translation for um, people in Algeria. They translated it into the language of the indigenous mountain people there. Did you know that it took the people who translated the King James Version seven years to do their work? The volunteers creating this translation in Algeria took 20 years 
to make it. They faced lots of challenges while they did so. For instance, they couldn't find a word for faithfulness in the language they were using, so they had to translate it as keep his word. Thanks to our gifts, to the gifts we put in every Sunday and the gifts that United Methodist people around the world put in every week, new people are reading God's word in new places. And when they read, whether in their native language or in Shakespearean English from King James, the word of God is brought to life. Friends, these are stories about ministry happening both here, near us, and around the world. Lives are given to Christ, communities are transformed, and the world is changed because of the money that you put in the offering plate each week. These stories show where our priorities should be, where our hearts should be as we're giving. This year, once again, as a leadership team, we're asking you to give us an estimate of your giving. You should have received a pledge card uh, in your bulletin two weeks ago. If you didn't receive one, uh, we ask that you let us know and we'll give you one. For some of you, looking at that pledge card might feel a little uncomfortable or scary, or it might make some of you angry that we're asking you to fill it out. But I want you to know why we do that. Unlike a salaried individual who plans a budget based on a set salary, the church operates on the amount given and pledged through offerings. Now, we do that by projecting, by looking at what's going on in our community, by thinking about what we got last year and what what we might be given this year, and we make a projected budget. We think about what we might be given, and we prepare a budget for our ministries based on that amount. So in giving us a pledge amount for the next year, it helps us to look a little more realistically about the gifts that will be given and how we might begin to use them for God's work in the world. Now, this isn't a high-pressured sales pitch. There's no, you know, we're not asking you to sign anything in blood. We're not making everybody turn one in. We're just asking that you would prayerfully consider what gifts you have to offer to God and to God's people through Christian ministry and to combine those personal giftings with your prayerfully estimated financial gifts that will enable us as a church to discover and build and express Christian faith in the world. The estimate of giving is both for the church so that we can know as the year goes on what we can expect for the budget, but also for you so that you can track where your giving is so that you can intentionally ask God to help you think about your finances. The information you put on the card will not be made public. We're not going to advertise it or copy it or promote it or make an announcement about each person's commitment. It's between you and our financial secretary. It's private and confidential. But we do ask that you would prayerfully consider turning those in in the next two weeks. Our second scripture passage that we read from 2 Corinthians reminds us once again what happens when we follow God's plan for generosity. It says this. Can you put the, yeah, thank you, perfect. Perfect. It says, you will be enriched in every way for your generosity. Such generosity produces thanksgiving to God through us. My home church's mission statement for many years was, we are blessed to be a blessing. It was on everything they handed out. And it reminded us that we, what we were given was given to us for a purpose, to be used to share Christ's love with the community. Now, the stories I shared above don't even include the generous ways that we've been doing ministry right here in Cockeysville with your gifts. We funded ministries that taught and showed God's love to over 40 children at VBS, not to mention all year long during the school year to our children, youth, and young adults. Your giving has helped to fund ministry positions for Pastor Bill and I, which means that Pastor Bill has been available to college students struggling with transition, to high school students asking really important questions about God, to middle school students dealing with bullying and hard choices. It means we can be available to show up for families in need. Your giving has helped us to support people seeking to get education to be a pastor. One of our own members, Jim, and his family who are serving as pastor in North Carolina and going to divinity school, and a newer uh, member among us, Samson, who will go back to Kenya at the end of his education and serve in a ministry to street children. Your giving helps us to provide food to the hungry, shelter to those in need, need clothes to children around the world. Your giving provides a place for worship and music ministry so that people can come and hear about God's love over and over and over again. Your generosity changes lives. Reverend Mike Slaughter says it this way. Can you do the next slide? What you do with what you have 
has the power to change the world. What you do with what you have has the power to change the world. Friends, let's change the world together. Eugene Peterson writes in his version, The Message, from Romans 12, verses 6 through 9, he says it this way. If you preach, just preach God's message, nothing else. If you help, just help, don't take over. If you teach, stick to your teaching. If you give encouraging guidance, be careful that you don't get bossy. If you're put in charge, don't manipulate. If you're called to give aid to people in distress, keep your eyes open and be quick to respond. If you work with the disadvantaged, don't let yourself get irritated with them or depressed by them. Keep a smile on your face. Love them from the center of who you are. Friends, let's do that. Let's give aid to those in stress, encouraging, let's give guidance, let's show our love for God and our generosity to God's people. Let's love from the center of who we are. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.